this particular celebration of my master's birthday in a public setting is being done for the first time. We have never done it before. I have generally celebrated this day by myself alone. But today it so happened that I was here on the 27th of July. You decided to celebrate it here. So I'm very happy that on this day I'll be able to distribute Great Master's Blessed Food as Prashad, which is uh, not being done regularly now because of the larger number of people coming to these meetings. I can get the blessings of Great Master, but the food is but the prashad is served by Sevadas. And Rick Burgert has asked me to make an exception today because of a special day and the only celebration we have ever had of Great Master's birthday on a public holiday. Like this in a public meeting. So that is why I have agreed to his request and I am going to give you the prashad one by one. I must at this time tell you what Prashad means. Prashad means blessed, something blessed. In this case, blessed food. It's a very old tradition. And we used to have this experience with Great Master when he would give the Prashad, puffed rice generally. Sometimes he would put some sweets in the middle. It was quite a handful of prashad, sometimes with a sweet, sometimes not. I still remember as a young child going to get prashad and I would be watching whether what he's holding to give to the next person has a sweet in it or not. <laughs> and if there was no sweet, I would let the next man pass. <laughs> so I could get the one with the sweet. They don't want this to do today. They say everybody should get the sweet. So what they have done is, they are going to give two types of prashad, the puffed rice and the sweet. So everybody will get what I tried to get once in a while. <laughs> prashad is blessed food, which means that we remember who gave it, what was the occasion. And when we used to get it from great master, Every time we ate a little bit, we remembered Master. Remembering Master is like meditation. And that is why the Prashad helps us improve our meditation. Because when we, when we eat it, we remember, then we meditate also. So it's a good reminder. And that is why we used to make the Prashad last as long as we could. Did not finish it quickly. We took a little bit at a time. And that stretched the time during which we could remember the Master. The Master told us, if you cannot come to me again for having prashad, and you find that the volume of the prashad is dropping, buy something identical to that from the market. After this has been also bought from the market. And add it and shake it. When you shake it, you won't know which one is original, which one is not. So all will have the same effect. So that way we could stretch the quantity of prashad ad infinitum by adding every time when it was left to less than half. Prashad does not mean that there is any molecular change in the product. The only thing is it has the blessings and the memory of the master we carry with it. Do not use it in place of medicine. Some people used to do that. My child was sick, I gave little prashad. No, when child is sick, give Tylenol or whatever is needed, and prashad in addition. But don't think it's a substitute for anything else. It's a way to remember the master. So today, I'm very happy to invoke the blessings of my master. He is not visible to you because in this physical body 
He passed away on the 2nd of April, 1948. But he did one good thing to his disciples that they would see him even after he had left his body. So I can see him as clearly as if he was alive. I can also see him blessing the food. Therefore, it is, it is a wonderful moment for me to tell you that this prashad I'm going to give you today on his birthday is being actually blessed by my master. So it's a very special day for me and this special for you also. So I will now request the Shevadas here who have prepared the prashad to bring it up and we'll decide to distribute it. And you can come up to me one by one. If you were a smaller group and if I were younger, I would have come to you. But I am now over 90 and uh, I make that a good excuse not to do too much and not to walk too much. So therefore, I request you to come up in a line and get the parashat. Can you all hear me at the back? Those who cannot hear me, raise your hands. <laughs> very nice. I'm very happy that I was able to celebrate the birthday of my master, Azul Maharaj Baba Sahaba Singh Ji, today, with all of you participating in it. According to me, that itself made you all very special. And that you could get the prashad, blessed by great master, from my hand. It's a big privilege I had to give you that prashad. It's a very special blessing. Take a little bit at a time and make it last longer so the blessings can keep on making you remind of the true purpose of human life. The true purpose of human life is to be able to find our own true source, our own true nature, our true reality. Other things we can do here, we came for adventure. We knew the ups and downs here. It's a roller coaster life. Nobody has all great good things happening and nobody has all bad things happening. It's a combination that makes us a human being. And sometimes it looks as some people are very rich, celebrities and others. Maybe they have a lot more better karma than we have. It's not true. I've met lots of them. I've never met more unhappy people than those who are very rich and famous. They are unhappy because of their terrible emotional reaction to divorces, separations, being ditched by the partners, which they think is far more important than all the wealth that they have got. And on the other hand, I've seen very poor people, very poor farmers, enjoying great happiness and health which the rich people are striving for getting. With all the money they can't get, but the poor people have their faith, their happiness, their faith, and their delight. So there are some intangible things which we cannot see, and there are some tangible things. Those who have more tangible things have less intangible things. And those who have more intangible things, assets, they have fewer tangible assets. It looks like if you evaluate all of them, they are all pretty much very equal. It only looks different to us. So we are born here to pay off our debts. It's just an arrangement. An arrangement is you cannot be in a physical body without creating the conditions for becoming physical. And those conditions require that you have the use of free will. Is it really free? I'm not sure. <laughs> but it appears to be free. Not only appears, it is an experience of freedom. And that is what happens when the choice is given to us. Will you go right or left? You can't say I have no free will. You're bound to select. You say I don't want to go, your free will. I want to go left, your free will. I want to go right, your free will. You cannot help exercising your free will. When you exercise your free will, you create what is called karma. Karma is not created by any event. Somebody accidentally hits you, there's no new karma created. It's a payoff. 
you must have hit that person somewhere in the past. So the whole idea that we have done good and bad deeds, who determined which was good and what was bad? The society has been changing its norms, ethical norms of what is good and what is bad. Sometimes in the same light people see what was good at one time is bad now, what was bad at one time is good now. So we have noticed over different cultures have different values of good and bad, different religions, religions have prescribed different good and bad, and different times have changed what is good and bad. What is good and bad is what is held by our mind at any particular time. So our mind tells us this is bad, maybe completely because of social pressures, because of environment, but when the mind accepts certain things as good and certain things as bad, and does something which the mind believes is good, is rewarded. If the mind does something which it believes to be bad, it's punished. That's the law of karma, and it's working all the time. And it is because of the combination of this thing, we become human. Supposing, in a particular life, you were very careful not to do anything bad, not to succumb to any temptation, not to do anything that you would consider evil, and at all good karma, you wouldn't be here. You'd be in heaven. That's the reward of that kind of karma. Supposing you did everything bad, everything evil, you would not be here. You'd be in hell. And those heavens and hells exist in the astral plane. And you can go and see what's happening there. People are being rewarded and punished almost on the same lines as we reward and punish people here. So that is why it's only when you have a combination of both good and bad that you become human. And that's the basis on which we get a human body. Now, in one way you can say, maybe heaven is better. Nobody has ever been able to find enlightenment and go to its true home from heaven. Why is that? Because there is no free will there. Everything is known. Supposing as a human being, you knew what is going to happen in the next five years, you will lose your free will completely. You will see that you are drifting along a pre-programmed destiny. It is the ignorance of our knowledge of the future that is giving us a feeling of real free will. Knowledge could dispel it. Ignorance is sustaining this. But there is a purpose in that. The purpose is, if you have experience of feeling of free will, you are able to seek. If this were not there, you couldn't become a seeker. And seeking is a secret. So you could not seek if you have no free will. And that is why, no matter how much of an illusion it is, it still works to make us seekers. It gives us experience of being seekers. And that is why it's a very valuable thing. Now, this particular feature, having an experience of making choices with free will, exists only in the human life. It does not exist among plants, trees, dogs, cats, animals. They don't make choices like that. They instinctively react to everything. Instincts are built in and they react. We also react instinctively in most things. 80% of our life is run instinctively. Only 20% we make decisions. But those 20% account for so much decision making so many choices and intentions we express that we gather a lot of momentum of karma to get future lives. So that is how human life is. Even angels don't have free will because they know the future. When you have full knowledge, you can have free will. So it's a unique situation. In Indian literature, they have listed 8.4 million, Charasi Lakh, 8.4 million forms of life. And when this form of life, it has a soul. Same soul. Souls are not different. Souls don't have different faces and different characters and so on. Soul is a unit of consciousness. Soul is what gives life. Soul makes our mind alive and thinks. Soul makes our sense perceptions alive and we can see, touch, taste, smell. Soul makes our body alive. Life cannot exist without a soul. And soul is one unit of consciousness and therefore it's a soul that's experiencing a variety of things like these covers 
and we came here for an adventure. And we have the ability to go back in a human life. So I'm very happy that we have this great blessing of having a human life in which we can seek. And if you seek, you will find. It's simple. If you, whatever you seek, you will eventually find. But if you seek the ultimate truth, your true home, totality of consciousness, you will get that. It is in that case when you are seeking the ultimate that a perfect living master comes into your life. But there can be many masters coming into your life. There are masters who take you. There are, according to our spiritual Vedas, there are four, four masters everybody has. The mother is the first master. She teaches you how to grow and she takes care of you. The school teacher is also a master. He teaches you with education by which you can understand things better, you can read books. And the pastor or the, or the priest or the Molvi or the pandit in the temples, they are also masters. They teach us their own things. How to religion has taught you the existence of a superpower. And eventually, the spiritual masters who come to take you according to your seeking. Many masters exist today who take you up to the astral plane. And when you reach the astral plane, all the heavens are there. And you feel this is the destination from which everything was born, which is true. If you compare the heavens and what is available there and then compare them with the physical world, you will feel this is just a copy from there, a gross material copy of the heavens which are not material. Many masters think that is the end of it. There are some who say no. So long as we are bound by karma and the paying of our karma, whether in the physical plane or the astral plane, we have not found the truth. Truth will be when we find the secret where karma is created. So they can take you one step higher to the causal plane where you find all karma is created there. The mind is created there. And everything on the mind is created there. Time is created there. Space is created there. And that's the same thing we experience in the astral and physical worlds. It's good to know that. But then they think that's the end of it. And when they try to make effort to do something, that's the maximum they can reach. Nobody has ever gone beyond the causal plane of the mind by effort. Because effort is always involving the mind. You cannot use the mind to go beyond the mind. Yes. And that is why it's a limit. There's a limit how far one can go by effort. So what happens after that? And if that is a limit, and we are trying very hard something, the harder you try, the more you are limited. So then the pathway becomes effortless. It has to be effortless to go beyond that. Now, effortless does not mean that you can do anything about it, otherwise it wouldn't be called effortless. A friend of mine wrote a letter to me many years ago. He said, I have discovered that the truth lies beyond effort and it has to be achieved by effortless meditation. So now I'm going to try very hard for effortless meditation. <laughs> you can contradict yourself. The mind thinks that is normal, that everything has to be done with your struggle, with your effort. And that is why we think effortless meditation can be achieved by your effort. It cannot be done. How is effortless meditation done? Same way like we have effortless experiences in this world. What kind of effortless experience? most beautiful experience is the experience of being loved. When you are loved or you fall in love, is there any effort involved? Never. There is no effort. There can be effort if you are trying to attach yourself. There can be effort if you are trying to make friends. But the experience of love is always effortless. It's the same experience that takes you beyond the mind. Somebody, something must be there beyond the mind to pull you with love. And that love will take you beyond the mind. And these perfect living masters, like my master, they are love personified. You be in their company and spend time with them, you will know what love is. They pull you 
you in a strange way. The mind cannot understand it. So that is why it's that love. They take you from here. They influence you with their love. They have not come to teach anything. There are too many teachers already. They come to take the marked souls back home. Who is a marked soul? A marked soul is some human being who has decided it's time for me to go to my true home and is fed up with this and is ready. That's a marked soul. And because we are living in time and space, human beings have limited life. Therefore, these masters come again and again for the marked souls in their own lifetime and in our lifetime. So they match our lifetime and when a soul is ready to go back home, they come and pick up the soul and take it back. When a perfect living master says, I accept you, you are initiated, I will take you back home, our journey ends. Mind doesn't believe it. Then they say meditate to believe it. Then they say do all these things, make effort, and do all those things to believe it. So you can see something. Because the mind says, I want proof, I want proof, I can't believe without it. Okay, find the proof. It does not mean that our journey is interrupted. Nothing can interrupt the journey of the soul if a perfect living master has said, I accept you. The responsibility from that moment onwards is entirely of the perfect living master. And he has the power to do it. He comes with the power of totality, even when he's a human being. His consciousness holds the experiences at all levels, including the experience of totality, even while he's an ordinary human being sitting amongst us here. So that is why he pulls us with his love right from here. And he, our mind wants to work on something, to get something. So all right, meditate. All right, read books. All right, go to meetings, satsangs. All this is, does not mean that if you don't do it, you won't go home. All it means is that your mind, instead of opposing you all the time, will start helping you. Mind loves pleasure. Mind loves all kinds of pleasure, designed like that. Apart from doubting and fearing, it also wants pleasure. It seeks pleasure of every kind, whether it's uh, eating food, or it's having sex, or it's having any other kind of travel, going to the beaches, all kinds of things which the mind thinks is pleasurable, it seeks. Therefore, the mind's search for pleasure is always outside, outside of ourself. The spiritual path says the truth is inside, inside of three bodies. Mind is taking us out. Therefore, only at a time in meditation, in the practice of the spiritual path, we reach a point when the attractions inside are more than the attractions outside and the mind becomes our friend from being our enemy. Right now it's our enemy. It doesn't want us to go and meditate. You notice that when you try to meditate, sleep comes very quickly. I was once doing myself, uh, conducting a meditation workshop many years ago, and I was tired, I think. But I had close your eyes, everybody closed their eyes, and I could hear myself snoring. <laughs> I opened my eyes, everybody was staring, was going. But I turned it around by saying, I'm giving you an example. <laughs> it's an example. People tell me that when they meditate, they feel so sleepy. Some people can give up their sleeping pills and just meditate and get good sleep. So the mind, it is the mind trying to avoid our journey within, trying to avoid our attention going inside and keeping it outside. When the mind can go up to a point through meditation, through effort, it can go to a point and begin to enjoy inside, it becomes our friend and wants us to meditate. And that's a very big change. And the mind says, why not meditate? I have some time now, let's meditate. That happens at a certain point in our life. So this is all designed like that, that our spiritual experience on the spiritual path should be like that in these steps. So I'm very happy.
to share all this with you. I am sharing it from the teachings and practice of this man whose birthday we celebrate. This is not from books. Sometimes people tell me, show me where, it, where it's written in the books. And I feel not lost, I have not read the books. I read very few books. I only read books when they tell me there's something, show us in the book, and then I have to read it to tell them where it is. Otherwise, books are good to get basic knowledge. Our books have never taken anybody to enlightenment. You can read all the books of the world. It does not mean that you get enlightened. You get more information and on top of it, more contradictions. You find the books are so contradictory. There's a book called Spiritual Gems. It's a collection of letters written by American seeker or written by great master, his master to his American disciples. And people read the book. In one letter he says, you have to work hard, meditate more. Without meditation of at least two and a half hours, and if possible more than that, you will not achieve anything. One letter. Second letter says, Meditation is not going to take you there. It's the love and devotion that will ever take you there. Third letter. You can neither meditate nor have love and devotion without the grace of the master. All three contradicting each other by the same master written to three different people. Those people needed the replies that he sent. Now when we read a book like that and start applying to ourselves, which one is applicable? to us. None of them. They were designed for those people. Perfect living masters do not deal with everybody the same way. They know exactly at what level they are. And that is why they deal with each person, each seeker separately. And it's customized. This path is not a general path that anybody can read and go with it. It's customized to our own situation. We are not all at the same levels of our search and our seeking. Some are more advanced, some have done a lot of work in past lives and from childhood they are already having great interest in spiritual path. Some get it only toward the end of their life and they die and carry it on the next life. So we are at different stages when the perfect living master looks at us. He is not looking into our face, he is looking into our entire karmic history. He knows entirely where we are at this time and what we need at that time. And he gives exactly what we need at that time. And this is a unique thing. Therefore, you cannot use something said to somebody else as a lesson for you. You must have your own experience. If you cannot have experience outside with a living physical form of a master, you can have it inside. When a master accepts us, initiates us, he settles himself completely inside us. It's accessible to us at all times. It's not, not a simple thing. Initiation is a very big thing. Initiation means that you have now the master whom you saw outside as a physical human being, inside you from that moment, accessible in that form. Master ultimately has no form. It's like the soul, like ourselves. But in order to guide us inside, he takes a form outside and he embed the same form inside us. So when we meditate, we can have access to it. It requires some meditation. It requires more meditation if we are more involved in worldly activities. And it can be less meditation if we are already sufficiently detached, just doing our duties, our dharma. Karma creates our duty, dharma has pay off our duties. If we live a life like that, then it's easier to get the inside information, inside vision of the master. When you can stabilize the vision inside, it comes and goes, sometimes comes, sometimes stays longer. If you practice and you feel the pull of love of the master, you will practice more automatically. And when it gets stabilized, it is just like having a conversation with the master in a human form outside. He'll be with you all the time, 24-7. A great experience to have somebody with you all the time. 
somebody who's taking care of you all the time. People suffer so much from loneliness, and I know one certain thing, when you have the master manifested inside, loneliness goes away forever. You cannot be lonely after that. <clears throat> this is a great, great thing. So remember, <clears throat> the initiation by a master is the final step. After that, it's, it's just fulfilling something, obligation to our mind, obligation to our karma, obligation to duty that we have to perform here. And we go through them, ultimately, it takes us back home. I'll take up a few questions that Jonathan says people have left with him. They have. Is the Satguru on the physical plane the same for a soul <coughs> in the Satchkan? Is the Satguru on the physical plane the same for a soul in the Satchkan? Absolutely yes. <laughs> 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 Just give the right answer. <laughs> Is it possible to return to our true home without being given the names and receiving initiation? Is it possible to return to our true home without being given the names and receiving initiation? Giving of names is for meditation, for a practice. That's not a requirement for going to a true home. You can go to many stages. You get calmness and peace of mind by repeating any names. If you have nice holy names, you get more peace of mind. But it's not going back. No words can take us to a true home, no matter how holy they are. No mantra has ever taken anybody beyond the mind. Because they are spoken words, language stops. All kinds of language, even telepathic language, stops at the causal plane. So to go to our true home, initiation is a must. Initiation by your perfect living master is a must. Without that, we cannot cross the mind. What is the role of compassion of the master on the spiritual path? What is the role of compassion of the master on the spiritual path? Perfect living masters are always compassionate. Compassion and love flows from them automatically. It's a very important thing because in the relationship we have with a perfect living master, compassion is what even in the human form they show to us in order to say, they are taking care of us and they'll accept us and take us home. Compassion and love go together. It's not possible to say, I have a lot of love for you but no compassion. They go together. So the compassion is an essential part, the role of a master, and all perfect living masters have shown great compassion. Dear Ishwar, why don't you eat meat? What's your reason? Why don't you eat meat? What's your reason? The reason is I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> if I eat meat, I won't be vegetarian. <laughs> Why am I a vegetarian? Because when we eat anything, we don't eat stones, we eat living things. Even vegetables are living things. They have souls also. Animals have living things. Human beings have living things. When we take something to survive, which is a living thing, it creates a distraction of attention in ourselves. 
it interferes with the power of concentration of our attention. Supposing I pluck an apple from a tree and go and try to meditate, the thought I plucked an apple from the tree will cause a little disturbance which will go away after a little while. <laughs> Supposing I kill an animal and try to read a book which I was reading at a certain rate beforehand, like say a minute a page I was reading the book, like kill somebody and read the book, you cannot read it at a minute a page, you will start taking two, three minutes. The power of concentrating on the book will be lessened. It will take time to restore it. If you kill a human being, the effect on the consciousness, the effect not to be able to concentrate lasts much longer. So life exists on extinguishing life, not human life, all life exists like that. You will notice everybody, all forms of life are living on extinguishing other forms of life. Therefore, if we extinguish life at the lowest level, it helps in our concentration of attention, it helps in our meditation. And that is why it's a useful thing to be a vegetarian. That's one reason based purely on the practice of meditation. There's a second reason also. Second reason is how much do we consider is the value of the wealth we are getting through initiation? Is it a huge wealth or just a little bit? If it's a huge thing being given to us and the master happened to say, can you stop eating this food? And we said, no, food is, I can't do that. That means eating that food is more valuable for you than the wealth he's promising by initiation. So your whole judgment of what you are getting gets spoiled. And therefore, you are thinking, oh, I can't give up this. I can give up the opportunity to find the true wealth. So it's only another means by which a master can check how much value do you attach to this meditation? If you can't make this small sacrifice of what you eat to get better meditation, then are you still thinking you are ready for it? That's why we are avoiding eating meat. How can I get numb? How can I get numb? by being ready. When your soul is ready, Asta will appear and you can ask him, he'll give Naam. Or if you don't feel like asking him, he might even then give you Naam. Naam is initiation. We call it Naam name because he starts with the practice of repetition of words, names. That is why it's called Naam. But Naam is also meaning something other than the words he gives. In the Bible, John's Gospel starts with the verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The opening verses. How can a word, we understand the word or name, any word, how can a word be not only God, but be even mentioned prior to being mentioned in the name of God. In the beginning was a word. In the Hindu Shastras, Rig Veda, it says, in the beginning was the nod, the sound. All things were created by that, including all the gods and goddesses. A sound was creating gods and goddesses. A word can create God and can be God itself. Where did these words come from? We repeat in Islam the kalma, the word of God. We repeat in every, every religion that started somewhere mentioning something like a sound or a word as the origin even of believing in a God. How did that happen? There's a good reason for that. The ultimate creative power, we could have called it creative power. But what was it like that it can be there all the time with us? Supposing the creative power disappears, we all disappear. We are being sustained in our life by the totality of consciousness of which we are a part. 
So that is why that consciousness, that power, that creator has appeared in us and stayed with us no matter what form we have taken. And therefore we say that God is within us. Therefore we say our reality is within us. Our true self is within us. Find it there. If it is within us, how do we find it? When we go within, by concentration of attention at the third eye center, we hear a sound. A sound? It starts with a description of a sound. When we hear discourses, it's verbal. I have spoken to you in spoken language. I have not spoken unspoken language, but you can hear unspoken language if you go in. The unspoken language can be a telepathic communication or it can be any other sound. A sound is audible. It can be heard. Word spoken can be heard. You are hearing. Inside you can hear. Thoughts you can hear. So hearing or being audible is part of our consciousness. Now we start by listening to a sound and that sound does not get interrupted even if we reach the ultimate from where it originated. Because it is audible and we can hear it right here, it, it is called the audible sound current. But the audible sound current is connecting us with the ultimate creative power and uninterrupted. The spectacle we see the outer experience we see keeps on changing. When we go to sleep, dream state is different from waking state because we forget where our body is. We don't have physical body, we're sleeping. We have a dream body. But notice that in the dream body and this physical body, the self is the same. You cannot say somebody else was dreaming. The same self was dreaming, the same self has woken up. The same self goes up to the astral plane. The same self goes up the higher plane. The same self goes all the way to our totality. Self never changes. Everything else changes except the self. And what the connection of the self? That it can be heard. Your own self can be heard at this level inside, like a sound. That is why the particular yoga, the particular union with the ultimate creator, ultimate reality, has been called by this master and all other masters of that level as the Surt Shabd Yoga, the yoga of the attention, Surt Shabd, sound. Put attention on the sound within and you are on the way. And this sound will be continuous at every level. It changes form. In physical terms, it is a physical spoken sound. I am speaking to you. If you never heard, you would never know anything about what is inside. This is called Varanath Maksha. That means a sound that can be spoken and written. When you go inside, you hear a musical sound. A sound that is a spite of a vibration inside that cannot be written or spoken like we do this sound. So we call it the Dhonath Maksha. A sound in the form of a dhon or a melody. We go higher up. And the sound changes. In the astral plane, it is dhunatma. In the causal plane, it becomes like it's an endless sound. That when you enter it, it doesn't look like you just started hearing it. When you enter, you find you were always hearing it. It's a great experience to find something going on already and you just left it to go back. I was always hearing that. The sound, same sound, is then called anhad sham. On have been no limits. It's infinite, both ways. And you can still go further. It's still considered a sound. But it's changing into a more powerful sound where you know it's a creative power itself. You begin to appreciate it in the causal plane. When you are pulled by love beyond, beyond Brahma, beyond the creative power, beyond into Parabrahma, what we call Parabrahma, beyond the mental level, you go beyond that, the same sound becomes our, your own reality. You discover there was no difference between your soul and that sound. And that's called Sar Shabd. Sar Shabd is the real sound, which is your reality. 
And when you go beyond into the totality, they call it Sat Shabd or True. Sat Naam, True Shabd. Because that's from where the whole thing is happening. Because it is audible at this level, that is why it's been called the word or sound. So you can get the true sound by getting initiation and you get initiation when you're ready for it. When you're seeking reaches a point where you say, I've had enough of this. It's necessary. Supposing you say, I want more of this, you'll get more of it. You say, no, I want to be initiated, but I want to have some good fun and good time here. <laughs> First have good time, why are you in a hurry? You lived here so long, so many lifetimes, don't remember any. And why do you, are you not in a hurry? When you feel, no, I have, I have had enough of it. I've seen the ups and downs here. It's no more for me. You are ready. At that time, you can get the initiation. And that is how, when you're ready, you get noun or the word. Was that long enough answer? <laughs> This is a, a question about simmering and the sound. I often hear what you call practice sound. I'm afraid to stop doing simmering because sometimes the sound is on the right, sometimes above, and sometimes from the left side. I am confused about doing simmering while hearing sound. Often hear what you say about practice sound. I'm afraid to stop doing similar because sometimes the sound is on the right, sometimes above, and sometimes from the left side. I am confused about doing similar while hearing sound. A very practical question about meditation and must be the question which many people face. So I'm very happy that somebody has asked this question. When we meditate, we are supposed to put our attention where we are. We are behind the eyes at the third eye center, right in the center of the head. That's from where our consciousness is generating attention and is going out through eyes and through body outside. Since we are in the center, the purpose of hearing the sound is to reach yourself at the center. That's the main purpose of hearing the sound. While our mind's attention is outside and we are thinking so many things about outside, we can't even hear the sound. When we start, then sounds can start coming in. Many of the sounds are not spiritual sound at all. Sound can be created through attentive listening from the flow of your blood in the vein, in the arteries. Sound can be created by physiological reasons. And therefore, several sounds can be heard, some from the left, some from the right, and some may be from the middle. Now those sounds, supposing you cannot hear any sound, simran is also a sound to be listened to. Simran is not merely repetition. As I said in the morning, simran should be listened to. You repeat with the mind and listen with your soul. So attention, pay attention on listening to the similar. Therefore, similar should never be done in a hurry. It should be done slowly, every word being listened to carefully to make it effective. The secret is listening, not speaking. So when you have this practice of listening to similar, sound starts coming. Some of these sounds which are not spiritual, they don't pull you anywhere. It's just an experience. I call them practice sounds. Because even listening to a practice sound at least draws your attention somewhere in the head, though not at the right place. If the sound comes from the left, listen to it. Comes from the right, listen to it. Comes from both sides, prefer the right. Why would that suggest it? To prefer the right? Because the brain is so designed, it's the intuitive part of us which would be called the spiritual part of us, is located at that side, and the rational part is located on the other side. It's merely a physiology of the head that creates a better condition for you to be intuitive if you listen to the right. It does not mean that left sound or right sound is either spiritual or will pull you. It doesn't. 
ultimate sound that you will notice when you have a variety of sounds coming in. And then you can pick and choose or play with them. You play this sound, you hear another sound, some in distance, some are near. Generally, the sound coming from the center is at a distance. And the sounds coming from the sides, which are many bodily sounds, they come from the right and left. If you can hear sounds on both sides, prefer right. If you can hear a sound in the middle, concentrate your attention on that only. When the sound from the middle comes, it'll look like it's coming right from yourself. That's where you are. This sound is not coming from anywhere except your own soul. The sound is coming from yourself, the true self, which remains the true self at all times, even when we reach our true home. So the self is generating that radiance of sound. It's generating that. The same self will generate light. Light and sound look different to us here. At some point in meditation, they'll become one. Sound and light will be looking like the same thing and will be experienced like the same thing. And they are both being generated by your own self. And therefore, the right place to listen to the sound is in the center. And when you find that the sound from the right side is very close to you, louder, and sound from the center is very weak, try to shift your attention from the louder sound to the weaker sound, because that's the sound coming from the center. Ultimately, put all your attention on the sound coming from the center. It's coming from yourself, which you're trying to reach. When we say meditate to go to within, we are going within to our own self, not somewhere else. So that is why that sound which comes from the self, the middle, sometimes it appears it's coming from above. It's coming from center here and above. This is the right place to listen to the sound. When you get that sound, you need not repeat the words of Simran, which are just Varnatmaksha, just spoken shabd. And you should listen to the other sound which is Dhunar Moksha. So, supposing the sound becomes weak, go back to the repetition of the words. If you feel you are not sure of the sound, keep on repeating the words. So it's a play between the two. If the real sound comes, it will pull you. Real sound, sound starts like it's very similar to the sound of the bell. Not necessarily the small bell, ting, 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 not like that. The big bell, which strikes and carries a peal over a long time. And when you listen, the peal becomes longer. So sometimes you feel it not like a bell, because you listen to the peal of the bell. It's the same sound. So when such a sound comes from the center, concentrate your attention on that sound. If you try to repeat the similar, you'll be distracted at that time. That is why it's advice. When the sound comes, it seems to pull your attention from the body much faster than any effort that you can make. So that is what is recommended. That's why it's called the Sudhshyam Yoga. That is yoga, union with the truth through listening to the sound. So when the sound has a pull in it, concentrate only on that. If it is halfway, somewhere, practice sounds, you can switch between similar and sound to make it ultimately Hearing this weak sound, it becomes strong sound. Bell-like, it becomes a continuous sound, and then it changes. But the main thing will be, it will start pulling your attention and making you forget where your hands and feet are faster than any effort that you make yourself. Can you do meditation while doing other things? Can you do meditation while doing other things? Of course. Meditation in its first steps are repeating words. You are cooking, you can keep on repeating words. You are walking, you can keep repeating words. How often should you do meditation? This some question was asked from great master. He said, if you do worldly things more than meditation, then you will be in the world. You should do more meditation than worldly things. So the question is said, how is that possible? I have obligations, I have duties to do my jobs, and I have to work to maintain my family, I have to do all those things. I have to look after my children. How can I be meditating more 
you say meditate two and a half hours out of 24, even that is so hard. And now you are suggesting I should meditate more than that. He said you should meditate 21 and a half hours and do worldly work for two and a half hours. And then he explained how it can be done. He said, if you can practice the repetition of the words at all times when you can find the time, which is all the time we are walking, driving, doing anything else, repetition of the words is by the mind, not by the tongue. Repetition by tongue doesn't help. We are trying to control the thoughts of the mind by repeating words so it can't think of other things. That's the purpose of the repetition. So if you practice repetition, the mind has one good quality, it develops habits. It will develop the habit of repeating words. If you can keep on trying to do all the time, if you develop the habit, the mind will be doing the repetition for you all the time. Every time you think of it, it's already repeating. You can wake up in the middle of the night, so you see the mind is repeating. Just make it a habit. When that happens, then there will be occasions when you will need concentrated attention on an outside job. According to great master, it's not more than two and a half hours when you need that kind of concentrated attention. A normal work can proceed while you're still, your mind is still repeating the words. So that is why if you can make it a habit, then meditation becomes 21 and a half hours and world work becomes two and a half hours. But till you reach that stage, try to first reach two and a half hours. That's only one tenth of the total time available. And we know how difficult it is to do two and a half hours. I came to the United States and to meet a friend and live with him, who was the initiate of a master, and he was very good friend. He said, come and stay with me. So I took all the long trip from India and went to San Francisco where he lived. I was tired. He said, I'm very happy, Ishwar, you have come and we will meditate together. So I thought I'll sleep, but, but he suggested meditation. So we both sat down at night after dinner and we said, what time do you want to do meditation? Not all the time. He said, 3 a.m. at the given time. So we set an alarm <coughs> on the clock and we tried to sleep a little bit and then alarm rang. We got up at 3 o'clock and I I also sat with him, cross-legged, and eyes closed. We started our meditation at 3 o'clock. I don't know whether it was a coincidence or what happened. I could not meditate. I was more interested in seeing what he was doing. So from time to time, I would open the corner of my eye to see what he was doing. Surprisingly, every time I opened my eyes, he was also opening his eye a little bit. <laughs> every time, must be strange coincidence. Every time I try to look, looking like this. On his watch, uh, we passed two and a half hours with great difficulty. And then he got up. He said, "Oh, great meditation we had. Thank you, Ishwar, for being here." I said, "My friend, it was great meditation. Great meditation on your watch." <laughs> Not on the third day center. Worried all the time that how do we complete two and a half hours? What would you get with that? When you have high quality meditation, thinking of your master, remembering how he talked to you, loving him, you would think five minutes have passed and two hours will pass. If you're trying hard to do something, and after five minutes it looked like the hour must have passed, it's only five minutes. It's all a question of the quality of time that you spend on meditation, not on the clock. That is why I do not recommend that you go by the clock. It's just a suggested time that you can spend one-tenth of your income on charity, on tithes, you can spend one-tenth of your time on meditation. Just a general suggestion which comes in two and a half hours. But if you can do high-quality meditation for half an hour, it's worth more than eight hours of mechanical meditation. Meditation should be done with the utmost love and devotion that you can express. It's an expression that we have of love and devotion for the Master. His love 
as you associate with that master, it draws us automatically towards that. But whatever we can do to express our love, we do it during meditation. People sometimes say, I am doing my Simran. I want to tell Master something very nice, but I am not doing it because I will stop my Simran. Do you know that talking to your Master is more valuable at that time than doing Simran? It's a greater, higher quality of meditation that you are thinking of your Master and talking to him inside yourself. Won't that draw your attention much better? So don't lose common sense over these things that comes and dictates that the whole purpose of meditation is to go within and master sitting there. You are going to meet him inside and therefore talk to him inside. The quality of meditation will change instantly if you start your meditation by talking to the master about what you are about to do, what you have done the past day, share the things with him and then start your meditation with much better higher quality meditation. So the answer to the question, of course, is can you do meditation while doing other things? Of course, yes. Dear Ishwar, is reincarnation real? Is reincarnation real? It depends on what you, what is the definition of real. When you have a dream, is the dream real? Yes, it is. Nobody can say I didn't dream. If the definition of reality is what you have experienced, then you experience a dream, it's real. When does it become unreal? When you wake up. Not before that. When you're dreaming, even if you say in a dream, I know it's a dream, and sometimes we have dreams like that, then we say, I know it's a dream. You really don't know, because you're telling people who don't really exist that you're telling them it's a dream. When you wake up, you don't tell anybody. You realize they were not there, they were made up by you in the dream. So that is why the definition of reality we are adopting is what we are experiencing. Right now, our only reality is the physical world, material world. No matter what we say, all other things are somewhere else, not real. When we wake up to those levels, they'll become real. This will become dreamlike. But till then, this is, dream, this is real. Is reincarnation real? Let me put this question a little differently. If we were living in our true home and came for the first time into this world, how did we get our karma? If the physical body cannot be made up without karma, how did we make up the first physical body when we came first time? Obviously, when we came first time, we picked up a package of karma which had a past life. Programmed, not lived. We never lived that. It was programmed in order to create this. That means we cannot pick up just one life without picking up a whole sequence of past lives. How many past lives? Infinite. To create each life, we need past life. We pick up a package to live one life, and we're picking up so many past lives which we have never lived. We are picking up so many future lives which we have never lived. And we may go back home in the very first life, and there will be past lives and future lives we never lived. So it's just an experience of generated, of creating an experience, physical experience of past lives and future lives. But supposing once we come here and we live a second life after that, then this becomes real as reincarnation becomes real. And if we keep on repeating, all reincarnations become real. The, remember, the past lives we can remember or the lessons we can remember from past lives, they all become real and future becomes real. Can we check this out? Is it possible to check out? if reincarnation is actually real. Yes, it can be checked out. The only way we check out things, when we check out, did we come into this hall? We are not coming now. We came into this hall earlier. To check out, did we come into this hall, what do we use? Memory. That's the only way we have to check out. Did we come into this hall? Yes, a memory. 
when you go to the causal level, you can remember all your past lives. And there you know for certainty that reincarnation is real for the system of creation that we are in right now. And therefore, it's only necessary to go to that point where you can remember. I want to tell you something very interesting for those who are deeply interested in understanding how we live. We live here in time. There's a past and a present and a future. Reincarnation is only possible if we live in this kind of time frame. Supposing we live in zero time, there will be no reincarnation. Our reality is in zero time and therefore no reincarnation there. But over here we are living in time. And this time is feeling us, <coughs> making us feel we have a real past, a real present and a real future. Let's examine this. Let's examine present first of all. How much time is there in the present? When I start speaking, it's future. When I've spoken, it's past. When was it present? Do you know the present or now has no time at all in it? And yet we feel it as time. How can we feel we are living in time when the present is zero time? It's just a joining together of the past and the future. It's zero time. So how can we say that now we are living in time when the only time we can live in is now. Somebody presented a book to me by an author saying, power of now, live in the now. The whole message was, live in the now. I said I want to meet any person in the world who is not living in the now. Everybody is living in the now. They know the place, to know the time to live in, except the now. They are all having now all the time. So, and now I have no time. How can we experience something that has no time at all? The reason is very simple. The immediate past we are calling present. That's what has just happened we are calling present. It's not truly present. There's no present. Present and no time. The immediate past is being called present and now. And therefore, how can you experience past? What has already happened? Is there any other way to experience except by memory? No, there is no other way. Recall of memory is the only way we can go and remember the past. And we can relive the past, but only through memory. What about future? Is the future real? Future is created by our human mind's capacity to hope, to fear, and to anticipate. Supposing these three functions are denied, there will be no future. Examine this. Examine if we do not hope for something, if we are not afraid of something, we don't anticipate anything, there will be no future at all. And in order to hope, it takes time. In order to fear, it takes time. To anticipate, it takes time. So all three functions are in the past. They take time, not in the now. So future is also in the past. Can you imagine what we call present is actually past. What we call future is actually past. And past is past can only be recovered through memory. So our whole life here, we don't realize, is just recalling and living a memory. Where was this memory created? If there was no time to create it, where was it created? It is created at the causal level. The causal level created in one instant millions, trillions of possible destinies in time. And we just picked up one capsule, one DVD from there and are playing it right here. It's a complete DVD. It's a complete destiny. And we're playing it here and thinking we are going through time. It's a, it's a remarkable experience. It's a miracle that now having no time is making us feel we are living in the present all the time. That is why if you examine time very carefully, that we're living in the physical world, it's nothing but a replay of something prepared earlier, not here, somewhere else, in the causal plane. Now, this is not a this is not a speculation I'm telling you. I am saying go there and check it out. You'll find that's exactly how all destinies are being created. That's where we picked up the destiny. 
That's where we created the kind of time we are living in. So it's very interesting that time is merely play of a capsule of memories that we picked up and we play them, they become real, real life. When we go higher, we recall this was just a game that we played, this was just a movie that we were watching, just a DVD we were playing the whole life. When we watch a movie, of course we are watching it on the screen and this life, we are living in the head of one of the characters. And the character we choose doesn't matter. And that reminds me, I am often quoted from that book by Geoffrey Chaucer, Canterbury Tales. That book was very important in English literature when I was studying for my master's exam in English literature. I realized that was a very important book because that was the foundation of the modern novel. The modern novel that is written now, the stories that are written, have characters. Some are jealous, some are proud. Before that, there was no such thing. If you look at the old story, once upon a time there was a king and there was a queen and they died and the story ended something like that. <laughs> they never say he was a haughty king or he was a jealous king or he was a kind king. Those words came up after Geoffrey Chaucer's book, The Canterbury Tales. In The Canterbury Tales, Chaucer talks of about 40, 50 characters all going to Canterbury on a pilgrimage. And he says he was also amongst them. So Chaucer becomes a character in that book. He's the author of the old book and also becomes a character in the book. They're telling stories to each other and they are singing songs and poem, reciting poems just to keep while away the time as they are traveling. And those are the poems which first start characterization of the characters in a book. For example, they talk of a, a lawyer, an attorney, and they say, a busier man than him, their nos, nos means never was, a busier man than him, uh, nos, and yet he seemed busier than he was, like a modern attorney, this kind of characterization. So the whole book is like that, it's very interesting. In the book, the other characters say, Chaucer, you are a great poet, you are a great writer. He has written all the poetry in the book. Come on, give us some nice poem. Chaucer says, I don't know any poetry. He says, no, come on, we know you are a great poet. How can you say that? Give us some nice poem. And Chaucer gives the worst doggerel rhyme in the book. <laughs> and all the other characters criticize him. Oh, we didn't expect that from you. Why has Chaucer decided to write a book in which he becomes a character insulted by the other character that he himself has created? This has been compared sometimes with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was son of father, one with the father, the creator, and he is crucified by his own creation. How can that be? The answer is very simple. At the level of the author, Chaucer was all characters, not one. He was all the characters. By participating in the head of one character made no difference to him so long as he knew he was the author. Jesus Christ knew he was one with the creator. It didn't matter who crucified him to create the passion for seeking. And therefore, he was constantly aware of that. When we are aware, of our true reality, it doesn't matter which character we go to. It doesn't matter at all. We are all characters. At this time, we don't know that. At this time, we have isolated ourselves as a character in the movie. But when we find our authorship of this whole creation, then we discover it didn't matter at all which one we had. It's a very interesting way how this has been arranged. And reincarnation and coming into separate lives is a created experience. If you go above the mind, what will happen? You go above the mind, you find everything was merely created for experience. Nothing was real. You were real. The experiencer was real, but not the experience. No matter what experience. The experiencer is always real. 
I am holding this cup of water. Very beautiful. It resembles a cup that great master used to drink water from. A silver cup. I am holding it. I am questioning. Is the cup real? Yes. How do I test it is real? I can touch it. Is the water in the cup real? Very nice sweet water. I had just a real taste of it. Somebody says, no, it's not real. So you don't know anything. I'm experiencing it. I'm experiencing the reality of this cup. I'm experiencing the reality of the water. How can you say it's not real? <coughs> he said, actually, it's not real. He gives an example. Supposing I have the same cup in my dream. And I pick up the same cup, just like I demonstrated now. And I have the same taste of the water. Is the cup real? Drinking is real. I had the taste. Touching the cup was real. I touched it. I wake up. Neither the cup was real, nor the water was real. Experience was real. This world is exactly like that. <coughs> Experiences are creating our reality. It's not that we think because an experience relates to objects and people, they're all real. When do we find the truth? That's only one consciousness, one dreamer creating all the dreams. Let me reach the top. And this is possible to discover this unity. Now imagine if we get that experience of realizing that all the people we are seeing are part of the same one and you are that one. Wouldn't you love everybody? How would you hate anybody? You are hating yourself if you hate anybody. If, if you call that creative power God, you are hating God if you hate anybody. And that comes immediately into your awareness. That ultimately the whole thing is being created from that one spot. And the doorway to that spot lies within us at the third eye center. What a beautiful opportunity to discover this truth. And you'll be loving everybody if you have even half the experience. Full experience, of course, gives you total awareness, total knowledge of how this is all created. Even the source of creation comes into knowledge. But even without that, your compassion and love will be automatic. You are denied this for automatically flow. So that is why these perfect living masters are constantly, automatically loving us. And there's no judgment in what. When they look at a person, the person says, I'm very bad. I don't deserve anything. They look at us and they hug us and they love us. And we say, I don't deserve it. They are not looking at our deserving and not deserving. They are looking at our seeking. That we are seeking the truth for which they have appeared in our life. That is why seeking supersedes everything else. You are seeking of the truth, of the ultimate true home. If you seek the true home, you will find the perfect living master who will take you back home. If he says, I accept you, your journey has ended. His work has begun and he'll take you himself. He'll make you go through things for the sake of your mind. Don't take it very seriously. Okay, thank you very much for such patient listening again.